So you probably thought on the first day the last thing you'd want to see on the, at the end of the afternoon is some equations and some arithmetic and some math. But many of our lectures, including some this morning, are solving equations for conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And so rather than having everyone introduce those equations, where they come from, and the assumptions that go into deriving them, we thought late last week maybe we should go through it all together uh, uh, in roughly about half an hour. And so this is what I'll try and do is derive for you uh, equations that describe conservation of mass, momentum, and energy with the assumptions that go into them and at the end introduce you to the concept of a dimensionless number. And I will number these one through four. We'll start first, however, with the underlying premise behind everything we will be doing, which is something called the continuum hypothesis. And we know that liquids are made of molecules, at, uh, gases are made of atoms, rocks are made of crystals. And rather than trying to describe the behavior of every single atom or every single molecule, we describe it as uh, some kind of bulk material. And so let's imagine we measure some property uh, and pick some property. What property should we measure? No, d density, OK. I like density. I don't like temperature. We will measure density going from small scales to big. And we don't need to put any numbers on these axes. right? So we're going to take a small volume and, and measure the density, say, in, a, in the gas in this room. You may encounter an atom or a molecule, you may not. And so your density may fluctuate uh, to, as you measure things at small scales. Once you start averaging over a sufficiently large volume, however, you're averaging over a large number of molecules. That average may settle down to some number. And as you get to bigger scales, it could be you have gradients and properties. Other things vary over that scale. And your properties change as scale changes. And so we'll be interested in this length cell here. Right? that's big enough that we don't have to worry about scales of atoms or molecules. If we have a two-phase material, say two different liquids or two solids or solids plus liquid, right, we need to be big enough that we see many of those structures. Okay. So that will be the underlying uh, approximation behind everything we do. Okay. So I'm going to start now with conservation of mass, then we'll go to conservation of energy, conditions about assumptions, a notation, the vector calculus, just interrupt and ask. And I'm going to skip the background of uh, vector calculus because Ved showed you that this morning. OK. So conservation of mass. And we will imagine we have some volume here fixed in space with volume V. It's bounded by some surface area S. And this surface area S includes all surfaces. So if we have a surface at infinity, that surface is included as well. And to characterize the orientation of the surface, we'll identify the surface with a normal vector n. Uh, some bit of notation. When I put a line underneath something today, that indicates a vector. If there's no line, it's a scalar, has no direction dependence. When you see two lines later on, that will be a second rank tensor. And what is the meaning of n? If we take the dot product of n with itself, that's equal to 1. Or equivalently, the magnitude of this vector n is equal to 1. Right? So it's simply a line pointing outward from that surface. And we, will, we would like to know how uh, the amount of mass inside this volume will change over time. Okay, so we're going to have some density inside here, which could be a function of position, and it may vary as a function of time. What are one, what's one way we can make the amount of mass inside that volume change? Uh, but that volume V is fixed in space, so the volume is not changing. Good. We will do the case, actually, where the volume is changing later. Yeah, we could have a flux through the surface. So let's add one a complication. We may have a fluid. We're, uh, everything today will be for fluids. Okay. So we have a flow with velocity x, which could be a function of space and time. And now we're taking material from inside this volume, moving it across the boundary. What's the rate locally of mass flux across that boundary? So it'll be mass per unit time per unit area. Asking I'm asking you. Yes, not VED in particular, because I know VED knows the answer. Yes, yeah, so we'll dot the, uh, OK, so it'll be mass, right? Mass will obviously depend on density, right? Times the rate at which fluid is moving. And someone, I couldn't remember who, 
said, well, dot product with the normal vector. Why? The dot product is you're projecting the velocity onto the normal, right? And why are we doing this? If the flow is perfectly parallel to the boundary, do we have any mass transport across the boundary? We don't, right? And so what we care about is the component of mass flux across the boundary perpendicular to that boundary. OK, so the net rate of mass flow across the boundary will be the integral of that mass flux, rho u dot n, integrated over that surface. Right? We'll simply walk around the surface and add up all the mass that's flowing across that boundary. Okay. What is that? Does that have to be equal to any particular number? Let's imagine it's a positive number. What's going to happen to the mass inside this volume? Right. We're losing mass, right? We're transporting mass across that boundary. And so if we're losing mass inside the boundary, what's happening to the density? It's decreasing over time. So we've just computed right, the rate of change of mass inside that volume. What's the amount of mass inside this volume be? Yes, yeah, the density over the volume. And I'm going to, I left a bit of space so I could put a minus sign. Why? Right, if we have a net flux of mass out of the boundary, the left-hand side is positive, and the right-hand side should decrease. OK, so this is change in mass. Uh, sorry, I should have a derivative with respect to time, right? And because our volume is fixed with respect to space, I can put the derivative with respect to time inside the integral sign. This will be the first of many typos I will make. <laughs> I'd like to say I'm doing this on purpose, right, to see if you're paying attention. But the reality is that's not the case. OK. So, okay. Ah, so we have an integral differential equation. We have derivatives in space and time plus integrals. One of them, unfortunately, is over a surface. One is volume integral. But there's a hand trick we can use called using the divergence theorem. And the divergence theorem says that if you have the integral of something dot product with the normal over a surface, you can replace with this with, this with the volume integral that's the divergence of the thing dot product with the normal. So the left-hand side becomes, use divergence theorem, the integral over volume of the divergence of rho u. I'll take the right-hand side, put it onto the left-hand side. So the derivative with respect to time of rho, integral with respect to volume, is equal to 0. And we've said nothing magical about what that volume is, right? It applies to any volume of space. And so the only way for this integral to be equal to 0 is that the integral is equal to 0. Okay. And so now we have right, a single differential, partial differential equation that describes conservation of mass, where we have made what assumptions? We haven't. Wow. Have we? We haven't said anything about constant volume, have we? So I think we've made absolutely no assumptions up to this point. The equation is the same as the continuity equation. Uh, we, we, made that, we made that assumption in the derivation of the equation, but the equation itself, now we no longer need to make that assumption. I'll, I'll show you a different way of deriving this equation, uh, where we will let our volume vary in time as well in passing, depending on how time goes. OK. So following on that comment about how we said our volume was fixed, we're interested here in fluids, right? Flu Sorry? Can I erase the can I raise the board? Yes, I can do both. Maybe. So this is cutting into my thirty minutes, right? So we're talking about does it? I don't think this is electronic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, let's go. We'll just erase. So what we're going to do now to follow up on your previous comment is we said this volume V was fixed in space. But often it's more convenient to think about derivatives in a frame of reference that's moving with the fluid. Right? After all, we said we have a fluid moving with speed u. Right? We can imagine putting some imaginary line around that fluid. And then we're going to follow that package of fluid as it moves through uh, over the blackboard. Is there a trick? I'm sure it's not electronic. <laughs> Should we pull? Well, this, this is perfectly fine. So we're good to go. So what we'd like to do now is calculate our derivatives, not in a stationary reference frame, but in a reference frame moving with velocity u. Okay. And so we will imagine we've got some function phi that is both a function of space and in time. Right? And so if we would like to take a derivative uh, of this quantity in the moving reference frame, what can we do? Well, we, the change in phi, because it depends on two different quantities, right? will be the change of phi with respect to in just one dimension with respect to x times dx plus the change of phi with respect to time times our time step. OK, so now let's take the derivative with respect to time. dt over dt is what? That's 1. What's dx with, what's the change of position with respect to time? That's a velocity, right? Or velocity u in one dimension. And we can generalize to three dimensions, right? In three dimensions, then, our derivative in a reference frame moving with respect to the fluid. And I'm using the uh, symbol capital D, often called material derivative, or convective derivative. is equal to the change of phi with respect to time. Right, that was our last term over here. Plus the dot product between the velocity and our gradients of phi. Okay. And so one way we can think about this, exp I'll, I'll come back to that. So one more aside I will make before we derive a statement uh, of conservation of momentum uh, is to revisit something I just erased by accident on the right-hand side. We had an integral over a volume of something. We had a derivative on the f side. We will now also want to take a derivative with respect to time inside the integral sign of something that's varying, varying in time. And there's a theorem that allows us to do this, which I will not derive for you, called the Reynolds transport theorem. And the Reynolds transport theorem will look a little bit like the material derivative we just had on the board. The derivative with respect to time in the moving reference frame of the integral of something over volume that varies in time. Let's see, dv. OK. So same thing we had before. We've got some quantity we're interested in. We're doing a volume integral. But now our volume is going to vary in time. And I don't have the picture left on the board to illustrate that. And we're going to take a derivative now in that moving reference frame. Uh, this will be equal to the integral over volume of the time derivative of that function, 
plus the divergence of phi times the velocity. And you'll see that there's a point of writing down this Reynolds transport theorem for you. But actually, you know what, before going to conservation of uh, momentum, let's briefly revisit just over here our statement of conservation of mass. Now we're going to take a volume here, V. But V will be a function of time. And it's defined as a function of time such that that boundary is moving with the fluid as it's moving. All right, so we've got some flow here with velocity u and some surface area that will also be a function of time because that volume is moving. Now, in this case, in the moving re reference frame, what do you know about the amount of mass inside this curve? In the moving reference frame, right? So your fluid's moving through this room, you, cir you circle some area, and then let the fluid carry that area around. All right, the total mass inside this volume has to, inside the surface area has to stay the same, or in that volume, because we're moving with the fluid. So mathematically, what are we saying? We'll integrate over volume V of the density uh, dV. That's the total mass inside that volume, right? And it's not changing in that moving reference frame. That's equivalent to saying that the material derivative in that moving reference frame of that quantity is equal to zero. OK, now we'll apply this beautiful Reynolds transport theorem in the upper, on the upper right-hand side of the board. And what do we get? We get the time derivative of density with respect to time plus the divergence of rho u is equal to zero. Right. Does that equation look familiar? Yeah, it's been a long afternoon, right? But seven minutes ago, it was on the board on the right-hand side. <laughs> and we der derived it last time, right, in a stationary reference frame. Right? So we just thought about, in the stationary reference frame, mass moving across boundaries. In the moving reference frame, nothing moves across boundaries. Right? We just have to take a derivative in the moving reference frame. OK. So now we'll do something a little bit more complicated. It'll be conservation of momentum. And you have seen this before today. Right? Ved derived an equivalent statement for solid elastic materials right, that were governed by an equation like Hooke's law. And there'll only be very, very small differences between what we will see now and what Ved did earlier. OK. What is momentum? It's mass times velocity, right? OK. So remember, momentum per unit volume will be density times velocity. So our statement of conservation of momentum says that the time rate of change of momentum is going to be equal to something. Right? How, how do we change momentum? Imagine you've got fluid moving through this room or an object. How are we going to change its momentum? You apply forces to it, right? So this will be equal to the forces that act on the object. OK. So I tried to write in briefly in words what's going on conceptually. Now we're going to try and put equate. Uh, our variables onto this problem. And again, our problem will be we have some volume here, V, right. some velocity moving through across the board, velocity U, a surface area S, and a unit normal vector to the surface to characterize that surface N. Okay. So in that moving reference frame, the total momentum we have inside this volume will be the inter. Grow, uh, point wise, the momentum is density times velocity. Right? The total momentum inside that volume will be the integral over volume of that quantity. And the rate of change of that momentum in the moving reference frame will be the derivative with respect to time, or material derivative, of that integral. Okay. 
And this is going to be balanced now by a set of forces that act on that volume. And we've got two types of forces that act on that volume. There are forces that act throughout the volume, right? This is what Ved this morning called body forces. There will also be surf, uh, forces that act on that surface. Okay. We will let the forces that act on that surface be denoted with the symbol T vector. Okay, T vector. It's a force per unit area acting normal to that surface, right? But it's got a direction associated with it. Why a direction? Force is a vector, right? It's got a direction associated with it. Okay, so we've got surface forces T, body forces acting the volume. And our body forces, uh, what's an example of a body force? Gravity, right? The one Veg used this morning, the one you just mentioned was gravity. So rho G V. Okay, and then we've got surface forces. Our surface forces were T. And because they're surface forces, how are we going to compute their total sum? Can we do a volume integral of those surface forces? We can't, right? They act on the surface, so we do an integral, we sum over that surface of what those forces are. Okay. And I will try and be a little bit more careful. For all the inter integrals, right, the surface and the volume can vary over time because we're in a moving reference frame. Okay, you know what to do at the left-hand side, right? What'd you do at the left-hand side? Right, again, once, once again, the problem is we've got integrals, we've got derivatives, right? Well, we want to get something that looks like a differential equation. So the left-hand side, we do what? We use the Reynolds transport theorem, which fortunately I left on the board, right? To take the derivative sign inside the integral. This is fine, it's an integral over volume. Here it's a little bit tricky. So what we are going to do, and this is what Ved talked about this morning, is uh, introduce something called a stress tensor. Okay. We are going to let the stress vector be equal to the dot product between our normal to that surface and something that has uh, is now a second rank tensor. So I put two lines on here indicating that it's a quantity that involves two different directions. In the index notation that uh, Ved was using this morning, he called it, say, Tij. If we had a little volume here, we'll let um, y be vertical, x horizontal. Right? There'll be, for example, a stress T in the x direction on a surface oriented in the y direction. On this side, we may have a stress, for example, in the y direction on a surface oriented in the x direction. And what do I mean when I say a surface oriented in the x direction? Right, how do you characterize the orientation of a surface? It was by the normal vector, right? That's why we have these normal vectors here. It describes the orientation of that surface. And so this normal vector to the surface is pointing in the x direction, hence the x uh, subscript. Okay. Okay, so I think that's good enough. Now, if we go to this term over here, I just replaced it with n dot t. What can I do with that expression? Now, we, it's a surface integral. Everything else is a volume integral. How can I convert a surface integral to a volume integral? We use the divergence theorem once again, right? So this will be now the integral over volume of the divergence of t. And maybe this is unfamiliar because this is a second rank tensor, and I bet in your vector calculus class, you, if you ever took one, that was just a vector. But the concept and the principle is the same. So to skip a, uh, a little bit of uh, writing things down, Barbara? I don't think there's any time derivatives missing. Okay. Okay. So using the Reynolds transport theorem, which I haven't written down here, we have everything integrated with respect to v, integral with respect to v, another integral with respect to v. And so again, the only way for the sum of all the terms to be zero is if the integrand itself is zero. And so that integrand looks like the derivative of rho u with respect to time plus divergence of rho u u is equal to uh, rho g plus the divergence of stress 
Okay. Uh, Fed gave you some nice little vector calculus identities. Here's one that is also useful, right? Let's just imagine that uh, density is constant. I can take density outside of this derivative sign. You might wonder what the divergence of the product of two vectors u times u is. And this is equal to u times the divergence of u plus u dot grad u. Okay, so if density is equal to a constant, and uh, this will be the first time we've made an approximation today, I think, right? So one thing, I, one of the points of going through this exercise uh, is to keep track of all the places we will start making assumptions and approximations. If density is equal to a constant, I can take it out outside of the time derivative. I can take it outside of the spatial derivative. And then we're going to be left with the divergence of u, u is equal to this. Remember, we had one more equation, right? The continuity equation. The continuity equation was the derivative of rho with respect to time plus div rho u is equal to zero. If density is equal to a constant, how can I simplify this equation? Time derivative is zero, right? Rho is a constant, so I can take it outside of the derivative sign. And so we're left with the divergence of velocity is equal to zero if rho is a constant. If the divergence of velocity is zero, notice this term is equal to zero as well, right? And so our top equation right here now looks like rho times the derivative of u with respect to time plus u dot grad u is equal to rho g plus the divergence of stress. Okay, so we have a pair of equations right here. And up to now, we've only made one assumption. Density is equal to const a constant to simplify things a little bit. And I guess we didn't really have to do this. We could have just left, started with this equation and the continuity equation. Okay, so are we set to go? Can we apply this equation and start solving fluid flow problems or any other problem? So in order to solve a set of, we have a set of equations, right? How many equations do we have right here? Nate says two. Two plus one. Well, let's see. Let's, let's count equations, right? And we'll assume we live in a three-dimensional world, right? We have four equations, right? We have one equation from conservation of mass. This is a, a vector equation, right? U has three different components. So one for ux, you pick your th favorite coordinate system. So we have four equations all together. Louise? Oh, it's just uh, ugly. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. So we have four equations. Yeah, but you can take gradients of vectors. A gradient of a vector, of course, will be a second rank tensor, right? So it'll involve two different directions. But every time you see a dot product, there's a contraction of one of those directions, right? So a dot product between a second rank tensor and a, a vector gives you a vector again. Uh, something I should have said in passing, right? What's the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, physically? That's an acceleration, right? And so this is maybe what you might call a normal acceleration in a stationary reference frame. This term here also involves accelerations as well, right? But it's an acceleration because as you're moving through the fluid, Right, with speed u, you're encountering different velocities. And associated with those different velocities that you encounter as you move through the fluid, your velocity is also changing. And so this expression here describes what's often called the convective accelerations, I'll, which I'll abbreviate because I'm running out of space, convective acceleration. Changes in velocity because your velocity field itself is varying in space. And if you go back to the original notation I introduced before, right, this term here is also equivalent to the material derivative of u, or the convective derivative, a change of velocity in the moving reference frame. Okay. <clears throat>
So before that short aside, we're trying to figure out, can we solve this set of equations? And are, are we done? And can we move on? Uh, how many equations for how many unknowns? I'll start you. Velocity has how many unknowns? Three. Stress we don't know either. How many unknowns in the stress? Nine. Three plus nine is? So we're a bit stuck, right? We've got four equations and 12 unknowns. And we're going to have to do just a little bit of work to convert this into something that is actually solvable. Okay. And so this is where we have to introduce the source of much of the complexity, certainly in the kinds of problems that we're interested in, uh, in something that's called a constitutive law. But maybe before doing that is earlier today, Ved told you that the stress tensor is symmetric. What, if you write this as a matrix, for example, it means that a, a symmetric matrix means if you have a diagonal here, the left-hand side, if you flip it over, that diagonal looks like the other side. And you can show that the stress tensor has to be symmetric through another conservation principle we're not going to go through on the board, conservation of momentum. And the easiest way to think about it qualitatively, right? I erased it. We had those stresses, Txy, Tyx. Right? You can compute the torque uh, across the center of this uh, object from each of those stresses and then add them all up. And if there's a net torque on this object, it would start spinning and get spin faster and faster. And so in order for the torques to balance, Right, or the moments to balance about the center, Tyx has to be equal to Txy. And that means that the tensor or the matrix, if you want to think about it that way, has to be symmetric. OK, if we make this symmetric, we're down to how many unknowns? We're down to nine unknowns. So we're making some progress, but we're not, there, we're not quite there. So this is where we introduce something called a constitutive relationship. And in a constitutive relationship, we will need to say that our stress tensor T, maybe without thinking too hard, you can guess that the only way we can do this is if our stress T is going to be some function of velocity, right? We have to basically get down to a number of unknowns that's very close to the number of equations, which has three, com three velocity components. And so we will subdivide our stress into two parts, the isotropic part that Ved talked about earlier, which he called pressure. It's something that's uniform. It acts in all directions. I, earlier today, I think was usually called delta Ij. Basically, it's ones along the diagonal of a matrix, zero elsewhere. Right. OK, so this is the isotropic stress, the pressure. It acts uniformly in all directions, plus something else the deviat called the deviatoric stress. I'll use the symbol tau, hoping that other people will use something somewhat similar. And this is now where we're going to have to make our assumptions. We can assume that this deviatoric stress could be a function of the velocity. Maybe it's a function of velocity gradients. Maybe it's a function of spa second spatial derivatives of velocity. Maybe it'll depend on the time history of velocity, and so on. Okay. And that should be a closed parentheses over here. So essentially what we're going to do is assume that our stress, the deviatoric stress that we, uh, is a function of the velocity of the fluid. And in particular, for something that we call a Newtonian fluid, we're going to assume that the stress tau is proportional to velocity gradients. Okay. This was the constitutive law, in fact, that Ved, similar to what Ved wrote down, right? This is, uh, Derivative of velocity with respect to space is a strain rate. Strain is a, velocity, a change in position with respect to uh, space. So now we're taking a change of strain with respect to time. Okay, so this is an assumption, right? In fact, this is the, the most important key assumption we will have made up to now. Uh, what do we know about tau? Not very much, right? Except that it does have to be symmetric. Is the gradient of velocity symmetric? Take any vector, right? Use any vector. Does it have to be symmetric? There's no reason for it to necessarily be symmetric. So if you want to make something symmetric, right, the easiest thing to do is to add it to its transpose. 
also build the transpose again as you take your matrix. You just flip it about that diagonal. And if you take something, you add to it something flipped about the diagonal, then it has to be symmetric. Okay, plus there's an anti-symmetric part, I guess, just to be careful here on the board because I think we're being recorded. We have to subtract from it, right, something else. Okay, this quantity here is called the rate of strain tensor. I'll denote it E. Okay. So what we're going to say then is that this deviatoric stress tau is linearly proportional to the rate of strain E. Okay. So earlier this morning, Ved wrote down an analogous equation. He said the stress was proportional to the strain tensor. And, he's, and the simplest linear relationship between those two second rank tensors involved what? A double dot product with a fourth rank tensor, right? And Ved told you that fourth rank tensor had how many uh, components or elements? 81. And in the most general case, there were how many independent quantities? 21, right? Okay, 21. And the reason by which you obtain those 21 independent components is a lot of work. And that's why Ved didn't do it. I'm certainly not going to do it because I don't have PowerPoint. But the reasoning is exactly analogous for the current problem. Ved also said something important too, that if you assume the material is isotropic uh, as well, so I'm going to skip the stuff that Ved put in his uh, slides this morning. If it's isotropic, things simplify a little bit. So you, that our stress T is equal to, again, our pressure P plus a constant lambda times the divergence of velocity. That should be I. Okay. Okay, so the isotropic part? Yeah. Yes. Why can you ignore that? We don't. So when we go through the work for conservation of angular momentum, in fact, we use this thing called the vorticity tensor. And there are lots of problems where you may have externally posed torques, in fact, where you care about the vorticity. It would be proportional to the first part. Ah, okay. But because we know that tau is symmetric, right, this is the symmetric part that linearly, okay. We're, this, Train of logic is we're assuming stress is proportional to velocity gradients. Because we know stress is symmetric, we only care about the symmetric parts of the velocity gradient. But you can still have gradients of velocity. You can have still vorticity in your fluid, right? Absolutely. OK. Plus 2 times another quantity times the rate of strain tensor. This quantity here is we've got two material properties that show up. The one labeled here mu is called the shear viscosity. The first one here is called the bulk viscosity. Okay. okay, so now if we go ahead and add up all our unknowns and all the equations, we still have four equations, right? And how many unknowns? The rate of strain just involves velocity, right? Here's a velocity. Here's our fourth unknown, the pressure. So we have four equations, uh, four unknowns. Pressure, three components of velocity, and th uh, four equations. Yeah? yeah what, what order that we assume the uh, The fluid itself. Okay. And this was the case this morning. For a linear elastic material, you had two material properties. OK. Now, earlier we said that if we, we made the assumption, in fact, that uh, density was equal to a constant. If that's the case, what do we know about this term right here? Zero. It's equal to zero, or we can leave it out. So we can take our stress tensor. Shoot, I erased the previous equation. We had an equation that had a divergence of the stress. We can take the divergence of this expression here, remembering that E is related to the velocity. And we obtain an equation that looks like density times derivative of velocity with respect to time plus u dot grad u equal to rho g um, minus the gradient of pressure plus mu grad squared u. The divergence of velocity of zero being assumed earlier on. 
And this is a very famous set of equations. It's the basis for most of fluid mechanics, and these are called the Navier-Stokes equations. Right, we can take the divergence of this expression. So you use a bunch of vector identity. I use some vector calculus, yes, to s simplify that. But e either you've seen it or you haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, I'm not going to teach it to you effectively. And if you have seen it, it shouldn't be too hard to do. Yes. Right. No, it's right here. Oh. Yeah, it's good. For an incompressible fluid. So, Barbara, right. So, what I'd like to do now before a bit of time, I'm going to finish in five minutes, though, I promise Bruce. Uh, let's make a list of all the assumptions, though, that go into, in fact, deriving this very famous set of equations. So, Barbara said incompressible fluid, right? And you can backtrack to see where we had to make that assumption. If we don't make the assumption, keep in mind, right, we have this additional property called the bulk viscosity that almost nobody measures. It's hard to measure. Okay, what else? Right. So, second big assumption is introduced a constitutive model that relates deformation to stress, or we described it earlier as being a model for rheology, how, how materials deform in response to stresses. What else? I guess embedded in that is we're assuming our fluid is isotropic as well. Uh, something that's not apparent, well, actually it is apparent. Well, I erased the board. We made one more assumption. And just yell out the answer because I can't look backwards. To get this final expression, we have to take the divergence of, uh, divergence of the expression up here, right? Notice we have a viscosity outside of any derivative sign. So we've also assumed viscosity is constant as well. Density is constant, viscosity is constant. We've introduced this thing called a Newtonian model for fluid deformation, and the fluid's isotropic. Okay, so I was supposed to end by doing conservation of energy. This one's even messier than the last one. Maybe before doing that, then I should introduce the, uh, no, I'll do that later, okay. So to introduce conservation of energy, we need to understand how heat is transferred. Let's imagine we have a material with some thickness L. One side is hotter than the other, t temperature T1. The other side is temperature T0. We can go to one of these sides and measure how much heat is being transferred, transferred through the material, this heat flux Q. And we find that it's equal to the temperature difference T1 minus T0 divided by that length uh, times a material property that we now call the thermal conductivity denoted by the symbol K. So that's for the very simple case, just two hot surfaces. We can generalize this to saying that the heat flux Q is equal to the thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient, where I've done two generalizations. First, well, one generalization. We're going to let the thermal conductivity possibly be anisotropic, meaning it can vary with direction. And a minus sign simply because heat goes from hot to cold. So for fluid volume here now, the way in which we're going to derive this equation is we have some velocity field U. We've got some volume V of T. And now we're going to worry about the fact that this fluid has some temperature T, as well as a density rho. Okay. What's the total amount of thermal energy stored inside that volume associated with its temperature? Energy is equal to temperature times heat, times heat capacity times density, right? So rho C T is the total thermal energy at any point inside that volume. The total thermal energy is the integral over that volume with respect to V. And we're going to ask how this energy changes over time as we move in this moving reference frame. Okay, so this is the thermal energy right here. 
To save time, I'm not defining C, but I'm sure you've all seen it before. So, In a moving reference frame, we're going to evaluate how it changes over time. And it can change for three different reasons. We can make heat, say because of radioactivity. So we'll integrate over that volume V of T, the rate of heat production. What are other ways we can change that thermal energy? Yeah, we can lose heat across our boundaries, right? Across the surface S, we can have a heat flow Q associated with heat conduction, right? So we'll integrate over S of T, the heat flow Q. And once again, we're only interested in the normal component of that heat transport, right? Because that's the only heat transport that will change the temperature. Okay, and this you know what to do with, right? You'll use the divergence theorem. So this will be the integral over volume of the divergence of Q with respect to V. And this is getting to be a bit of a mess, so I'll just put a box around this to keep it separate. Plus, there's additional sources of energy. There's work done by body forces and surface forces. And so you know what this expression is here, right? You can use this equation over here that's known as Fourier's law, right? You can take the divergence of Q, and you'll get K times the second derivative of the temperature. To evaluate this term here is really complicated. <laughs> you basically have to take volume, add up all the surface and body forces, and compute what's going on. And so I will, simp I will not go through that arithmetic for you, but you will see equations later on where you will see a change of temperature with respect to time, plus u dot grad t, right, the material derivative. There will be things that look like what we call heat conduction, thermal conductivity times uh, second derivatives of temperature, plus a mess of equations here that actually look like uh, viscosity times strain rate squared, uh, plus additional terms if the fluid is, not, is incompressible. And so the last thing I wanted to do is introduce you to the concept of a dimensionless number now to end. Okay. And we will do this with the equation we've written down here. Right? What are dimensionless numbers? They're, they're meant to express ratios of uh, different time scales, ratios of different forces, and allow us to assess the relative importance of different these different physics, or different terms in a governing equation. Okay. Yes. Uh, there should be a minus sign here, absolutely right, because if we're losing heat Q from the volume, temperature's going down. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so the way in which we do order, uh, to introduce dimensionless numbers, let's go ahead and estimate the size of the different terms in this equation. This term here looks like the material derivative of velocity with respect to time, right? Okay, and Bruce introduced you to a problem where we have a convecting fluid moving with some velocity u, characteristic velocity u, and we've got some dimension l that characterizes the size of the system. And maybe we have a temperature difference across this box or some other uh, dimensions that will characterize it. So now we'd like to know, given this equation, what can we do anything or think about it and assess the relative importance of these different terms. What's the order of magnitude of the terms on the left-hand side? I'll use a notation O, meaning order of magnitude. This will be of order of magnitude density times a velocity divided by a time scale. Okay. In the picture I drew on the right-hand side, we don't know anything about a time scale over which things are changing. But actually, we do. How can I relate time to things that we see in this picture? Yeah, we have only one thing here that has time. Velocity's got time, right? Length over time, we've got a length. And so if I divide, a bu divide length by a velocity, right, I get something that has units of time. 
Okay, our term here on the right-hand side, this term that accounts for the effects of the fluid having viscosity, right, that uh, limits your ability to flow, is of order of magnitude viscosity times a velocity divided by a length squared. So you may have a physical problem, right, governed by this equation, and you want to know, well, is the acceleration of the fluid important? Is viscosity important, right? What's the relative magnitude of those two different terms? And so we can do this. We will take the ratio of those two terms. Physically, inertia. The ratio of the terms that involve inertia on the left-hand side to this term on the far right-hand side that characterizes the importance of viscosity, viscous forces. will then look like rho u squared over L divided by mu u over L squared, which is density, velocity, length over viscosity. Okay. And many of these dimensionless numbers turn out to be named after famous people. This particular one is called the Reynolds number after Osborne Reynolds. Okay. And this was the first dimensionless number I guess you will see. Ah, second one, because Bruce introduced you to something named after Lord Rayleigh called the Rayleigh number. But in the end, all these uh, dimensionless numbers you will be seeing over the, up, uh, over the next two weeks are meant to describe the relative importance of different terms in a governing equation or the relative magnitude of different forces of different time scales. And they allow us to decide what, what, what physics matters and which one might not. If the Reynolds number is very small, what can we do to this equation? If the Reynolds number is very small, it means inertial forces are small compared to viscous forces. That is, the terms on the left-hand side here that describe inertia are much smaller than those associated with viscosity. And so we can leave out the left-hand side. Okay? And we will be left with an equation that balances buoyancy forces, pressure gradients, and viscous stresses. Okay. And that's where I'm going to end today, a little bit longer than I expected. <laughs> Any questions? Ed. Okay, so when, when you took the, um, when you assumed that the gradient of the shear uh, viscosity was negligible, right? That the gradient terms of the viscosity were negligible? Is this, first of all, is this okay if you think about realistic reality? And second of all, what equation do you use though? Ah, okay, so. You know, I guess I always think of that as the conservation momentum, and you can always take that, well, I guess the world was previously written. You can always take that um, constitutive equation and change that. I, I consider that kind of like depending on the physics that you're doing. Well, in fact, plug and play. And then everything that follows will be. Yeah. In the original equations, we said we got up to 12 unknowns, or that we made nine by, by saying it's symmetric. There was that term that involved the divergence of the stress tensor. So all you need to do is here, any model that describes the relationship between stress and deformation, and evaluate the divergence appropriately. And so up to that point, we made no assumptions and no approximations. And so if you would like your stress to depend on, biscot on uh, strain rate squared or have a temperature dependence, right, or something more complex, it just goes into here. It's only in going from this point here to deriving this thing called the Navier-Stokes equations that did have to make that set of assumptions. So to, as you start relaxing some of these assumptions, you just have to work your way backwards through the different steps we went through. Yeah? Would it be fair to say, and when you derive the conservation of momentum equations, that leaving out force and strength terms is a mistake? Or would you call that more of the, you know, something about the geometry? We have sources and sinks of momentum, in fact. So the sources of so uh, those two, we had change of momentum in that moving reference frame. It was bounced actually by a set of sources and sinks. There are body forces and surface forces. Uh, yes, so if, in fact, if you would like to have a source of mass or a sink of mass, uh, you could put them in, in the same way we sort of did. I hit it here in the um, energy equation. It was right here. We just integral the heat production. You can do something analogous if you have a source or sink of mass. Okay, so if you're interested in the details of the terms of the energy equation, just see me later, and uh, there are a couple interesting subtleties that show up there.